Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide is just around the corner, and we just got off a weekend of the closed beta. You were able to sign up on that on the Steam page or sign up beforehand and get access to it. It was a pretty wild time. I think it like peaked at something like 55, 60,000 players on Steam, something like that, something pretty huge. So plenty of stress testing went on. Plenty of bugs were encountered. There were some optimization issues with the graphics and whatnot. But in this video today, I want to break down my impressions of the Dark Tide beta and answer the question for you. Is it worth it at launch? Or at least does it feel like it's going to be worth it, right? It's kind of hard to make a full um, judgment call on a game in closed beta. But still, we're going to do this by breaking down the general gameplay of the game, give you an idea of what it looks like just kind of from um, the hub perspective. I'm going to go through my impressions of the gameplay, then give you my breakdown of each individual class. And you can navigate to each location I've just mentioned in the chapters in both the timeline and the description, or you can just jump all the way to the end where I give you my overall idea of whether or not it will be worth it when the game comes out. So let's jump into that, answering that ultimate question in Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide. So coming into the game, before we kind of go through some stuff, I do want to show some cool things off that I really, really enjoy. And that's just simply the process of creating a character. Now, of course, you choose one of four characters. Now, we don't really know how many classes will be introduced into the game right now. We don't know much of anything when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, hopefully in the future, we'll see more subclasses. They said that there's just going to be the one subclass per class in the game right initially. But... Um, regardless, when you make your operative, you choose pretty much, you go through the process, gives you a nice little bit of a, a breakdown on how things work and kind of some of their guns, right? Like, so if I click right here, details, their unique weapons, and there's way more than this. And I'll kind of go in that in my unit variety portion of this video, but just to kind of quickly show those off here. And that, that Grenadier Gauntlet looks like it's going to be so fun. So just kind of going through this really quick to kind of show it off again too, is you choose your home world and this kind of sets starts to set the pace for your character. And I don't want to click all these. I want you to experience them on your own. You decide how your childhood is, what you kind of did growing up, what defining moment it's kind of set you on your path, what thing, uh, not what thing, but what, what your appearance is. You go through this whole process, which got some great customization. Nothing too crazy. Um, a good amount in here. Nothing over the top. Um, but just enough that I feel like the character is unique to me. Uh, if I'm going to be making a character, why would they not be bald and bearded, you ask? I don't know why. And face some facial uh, tattoos, body tattoos and whatnot. And then some scars and height. The fun kind of stuff you go through. Then you kind of go into your personality. Now, these personal personalities are pretty cool because it determines three different types of voices that your character will have, but also the way that they'll approach conversations with other characters in the game, which is actually kind of cool. Like, for example, the Psyker has one where they kind of just talk to themselves a whole bunch, which is really, really fun. Just but day in the Imperial Guard. here's an example. Only I'm not even part of the guard this kind of longer. reads this whole not bit right here, um, which is really cool. Again, to set that kind of stage for this character. Then you discern, you determine what sent you to prison. You know, what was your sentence and which one of these four is it? And they, again, all this plays into your character. And as your character gains in trust levels, which is the name for the levels in this game, the, the, your story starts to flesh itself out and the conversation amongst your, uh, fellow companions does change as well, which is all like really, really cool stuff. I really, really like that about this. And then it all culminates in this, basically combining your birth world, your childhood, what you did growing up, all these things into this kind of cool little bio for your character. So that's something that I really like. It's kind of a nice way to make this random character creation portion of the game that they've put in with Dark Tide that's not present in Vermintide 1 and 2. They, uh, it's a cool way to make it actually have some presence in the game. So just wanted to quickly go through that. Let's jump into the actual game to talk about some other stuff. So when you zone in, you kind of jump into a communal hub very similar to, you know, like Destiny, stuff like that, which is really nice. It's different than what we've had in the past with Vermintide where you kind of have your own personal keep and you get to enjoy some of the uh, lovely music and ambiance that kind of goes on. But as you kind of run around here, <clears throat> this is where you get to go to the armory over here and buy weapons that recycle every, if I go buy weapons, see it recycles every handful of minutes. 
um, you'll get a whole new loadout of uh, weapons to buy. And as you level up your trust, you'll be able to then get access to blue and purple items eventually. Over there, you can go and choose your missions. You've got your crafting over there somewhere that is not active yet. You can get your dailies and weeklies right here. This looks like the same scroll from Vermintide, so I assume that has an effect on something. But essentially, you zone into the game. And then you go about your process of kind of setting up every match that you want to jump into, which I really like. Kind of, you know, same thing that we've got in Vermintide. Nothing new there, nothing crazy or unique. But then when we jump into the actual loadout screen, we can see our weapons and then the ability to discard those weapons, which then earns you money. Now, looking too at this screen, we can see some of the individual aspects of, say, weapons. You can see kind of, oh, we can look at the individual weapon. But then you get, okay, I'm looking at this sword. And the sword does a high amount of... I think direct damage and low amount of cleave damage. It can hit a lot of cleave targets, got a good mobility, fit it at finesse. Um, and then it kind of shows the light and heavy attacks as well as your special action being a parry. That's denoted then as well, right? Light attack is a vanguard, that's this symbol here. Heavy attack is relentless there, and then special attack action is parry. So you see those things kind of reflected there. So it's it's a it's an interesting little system, but they're kind of arbitrary lines. I don't know what they mean. I don't, there's no tooltip attached to this, and this is a closed beta, so I would assume that this has um, an explainer portion of the game that has choked my mouth there. Uh, an explainer portion of the game that we just don't know yet, so I have no idea what any of this means. I don't really know what mobility means or finesse means as it pertains to, am I faster? Uh, is it easier for me to block? Whatever it is. Um, also, like additional stamina, too, those kind of things that we've seen from Vermintide as well but just to kind of show you another weapon. And we also get our cosmetics. Now, with this, we get all of our different loadouts, all of our different things here. Like, I only have the uh, upper body unlocked for the Zealot, probably the class I played the most. Nothing in the lower body, your different frames, your additional uh, cosmetics, insignias, your stances, stuff like that, fun things. Moving into feats, you can see a little bit about how your character progression works. So. Every single character has an ability, a blitz, an aura, and then three iconic abilities. Uh, or, I don't know what you want to call these when that's called an ability, but three iconic things. And like, okay, this is incre increased melee attack speed, five damage for each 15 missing health, uh, every 90 seconds taking damage that would kill you, gain a vulnerability. Uh, an example, too, would be the veteran who gets like 75% increased ammunition, stuff like that. Aura, so every single character generates an aura, and that aura will help replenish your toughness. And that toughness is essentially a shield that acts as a precursor to your health, a different way to damage mitigate. And aura is different for every single type of character. So Zealot Preacher gives 10% toughness damage reduction allies in coherency when they're within the range of your aura, is what that means. And then Blitz, throw a stun, stun, grenade that stuns all enemies within its blast radius so everyone has a bl different blitz here and then you have talents for all intents and purposes and you can see that these talents go uh every five levels you'll get a set of three to choose from just like vermintide so one two three four five six that's a total of 30 uh talent points that you'll be able to well i'm sorry not 30 talent points You'll, at max level 30, you'll have your last set of talent points, and you'll have that across six talent points here. <laughs> but you can see that they get pretty cool as you get towards the end here, like deal up to 20% increased rain damage based on the proximity to the target, 5% uh, damage for five seconds on hit. Uh, some of the things that you get from, say, the veteran, which will allow you to have a 5% chance to automatically regenerate a grenade on a kill. Or if you're playing as the Psyker, you have a bunch of ways to change the way your Psyker abilities work. And in, in, like you, you modify them, make them better, buff them. Or even the, the Ogryn has one that allows it to, rather than just simply throwing a grenade box, he throws a grenade box and it drops explosive grenades with it. So there's a lot of really cool ways that these talents amplify your abilities and your iconic abilities and your aura and your blitz in really fun, cool ways, or just simply the way your character plays. Um, in a lot of just interesting ways, like 20% attack in five seconds on using Chastise the Wicked, uh, which is this ability right here, right? The preacher dashes forward towards the enemy, targeted enemy, replenishing all toughness, which is stupid strong, increasing the damage of the next melee hit by 25%, making it a guaranteed crit hit. 
but I wanted to talk about these things and show this stuff off because it kind of is a really good way to give you a good idea about how the game overall is presented and plays. So moving into a discussion about weapon variety, I'm using the uh, armory exchange here to talk about this. But weapon variety is kind of limited right now, and that's only because this is the closed beta. They've already said there are a lot of different weapons that are just not in the game. For example, you saw in the unique weapons for the Preacher, or I'm sorry, for the Zealot, is a Flamer. Well, you don't get access to the Flamer here in the beta. So there are, and that's a big question that a lot of people have had, or, or a question that a lot of, or a gripe that a lot of people have had, is a very low weapon variety. Again, with the beta, I don't expect there to be a whole ton of weapon variety. Um, I think the only thing I haven't used for this character is the Thunder Hammer, which is amazing. It just flenses off the skin of someone's face when you hit him in the head. It's so cool. But um, by and large, I'm excited to see how the weapon variety expands come launch, because we do know that there's a ton of items that are just not in the game right yet. I wanted to address that in its own section because it is something that a lot of people have brought up as a gripe or an issue with the game, but I think that once we jump into that full launch and see everything, it will be quite the lovely treat. So we've talked about weapon variety, we've talked about a lot of things now, and I want to kind of give you my idea on the general gameplay of the game. And I'm going to do this over the backdrop of random streams that I've recorded from me playing or just me playing with Indie Pride, whatever it is. So it, there's nothing on the screen that might be pertinent to what I'm talking about. Maybe it is, but it's purely happenstance. It's, it's just background uh, visuals for you while you can listen to my sweet voice. But my initial thoughts about the gameplay are that they're very strong. This is a closed beta, so obviously things aren't complete. There are things missing. Like I've said, with weapon variety, we don't even have all the weapons. So all those things to be considered. But with that being said, I think the game is in a really strong place for it being a closed beta with a month out. Sometimes you play those uh, closed betas and you're just like, oh man, this this isn't this is not going to be good come launch, is it? So I I feel very confident about the way the game feels right now. Um, I think that the the melee in the game feels very tight. It feels very very good. I, I like dodging left and right, um, backwards, forwards, whatever, uh, blocking with a follow up, follow through. All those things feel really strong in Dark Tide in ways that they don't in Vermintide. But I mean, I talked to Indy Pride about it, who's has hundreds if not thousands of hours on Vermintide and he said nope feels exactly the same so maybe it's me having a personal bias in that I like the setting more than Vermintide but I feel like the melee does feel a little bit cleaner a little bit nicer and it does depend on the weapon uh, I like swords way more than axes in the game the axe felt like I wasn't doing shit to anyone whereas the sword felt like I had a really nice ability to control uh, waves that's kind of their point right cleave damage versus single target high uh, penetration damage <laughs> penetration but even in the range combat which for vermintide you know range combat is present on all characters in some way shape or form depending on which subclass you are uh but i think that if you're playing krillian that's where it thrives right her her ability to just kind of snipe down um specials and stuff like that's kind of what she does when she's playing her way watcher at least but when i play the other characters it doesn't feel as tight this game has a first person shooter aspect with melee you know that's what they kind of said like for those of you coming in with that are first person shooters this is a, a melee game for those of you coming from for those of you for those of you coming from vermintide there is a big ranged aspect of this game and the range does feel very good i think with the kind of limited number of weapons that i used like the psychers uh pistol kind of feeling like a hand cannon from destiny or the um the dmr basically the dmr style for the las gun felt really good to me um i did have a little bit of an issue adjusting to the way the las guns recoil works and stuff like that but by and large i really liked it or the, the the auto pistol on the preacher was great the the ripper on the ogren is amazing it felt very fun felt very visceral i enjoyed it along uh, um across the board now what i will say though is that it's still the same as Vermintide when it comes to the portrayal of the range, the portrayal of the melee. It, th there's no new mechanic in the melee or the range that would make you think, oh man, this is a whole different game. By and large, the game does feel as if it is Vermintide 2.5 or Vermintide 3 with a, with a Warhammer 40,000 skin. And I'm going to say I'm okay with that. I'm cool with it. And, and if you don't like that, then you just won't like Dark Tide. I, I'm just going to be completely upfront with you on it. I'm not giving you guys a full review here because I played a closed beta. That's unfair to you. It's unfair to me. It's unfair to Fat Shark. So I'm not going to talk about that from like a, hey, well, you know what? The game's going to be an 8 out of 10. 
I think that the game will be very good. I think if they keep up the level of support but increase that they've had with Vermintide, it will have a strong long tail to it. I think that it will it'll continue to grow. Uh, my biggest problem, though, is with the subclasses being somewhat limited in the, inert- in the initial launch. If it is true, in fact, that we're only getting one subclass per class, we're going to need some more subclasses fast, I think. And if there truly is no mysterious fifth class that I've heard is a rumor and I've heard is confirmed, then we're going to need some variety to kind of spice things up. And I think that variety is probably going to come from the levels. We only had, what, four or five levels to really kind of uh, jump our way through. And the difficulty in the game is brutal. Difficulties one and two, not too bad. Two, two's got a pretty good ramp from one. But two into three is drastic. Three into four is huge. It's monumental. Because... There is so much more ranged combat in Dark Tide that it is very challenging if you're not taking care of any kind of specials because you have so many specials to take advantage of or uh, to, to take care of, right? You've got your grenadiers, you've got your netters, you've got your big augurins with shields, you've got your augurins with the guns, um, uh, not stub guns, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but you have got and then the augurins are just running at you. You've got your dogs that have a million health. You've got snipers. You've got gunners. You have the gunners that have shotguns. You have the gunners that have um, hotshot las guns. So there is just so much special variety. And a lot of those specials are a pain in the ass from ranged. And if you are spending a lot of your time in melee, those specials are going to eat you up. Even just the standard corrupted guardsmen with their las guns can just kick the crap out of you. So... The game does have a very steep difficulty curve that is either going to be a turnoff or it's uh, an attraction to you. I personally find it really cool because it means that there's more top end to the game for me. I can enjoy one and two with friends, kind of screw around. But if I want to get sweaty, jumping into three or four difficulty, I didn't even touch five, is going to be real adventurous. And I think that I really enjoy that. So that's kind of a bit of a transparency about the actual difficulty of the game being pretty damn brutal and i do like that the trust levels as you go higher in your trust level which is just your name for your level again your dialogue evolves like i was talking about so your characters go from just being yeah you know we're just a bunch of other inmates that are fighting together to hey we've been through a lot together and that kind of evolves the conversation between them. Their dialogue becomes different. It becomes more personal. becomes more introspective, which I think is a really cool way to play rather than just simply, yeah, here here you go. Here's just a, a batch of really nice dialogue, which, I mean, don't get me wrong. Vermintide's banter is one of the best parts of Vermintide. But this is cool that that banter now has an evolution to it. If you play with a bunch of psychers, they call each other siblings. The Ogrins will kind of talk about things back and forth in a dim-witted way, like saying, like, I don't understand what that is and what this is. Like, it's it's cool to see the relationship between multiple characters. And that is another big thing for Dark Tide. You are not relegated to playing one character per, um, per what's it called? per match like i can have four guardsmen if i want or um, veteran sharpshooters i can have four zealots two zealots and two psychers whatever it is and i think that that's a really cool way to mix up the equation and you can see that oh hey having two ogrins is really 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 strong having two psychers in a high difficulty is almost a necessity it just kind of mixes up the variety of gameplay a little bit in a nice way and it doesn't make you feel like if you're playing with friends you have to always play something you maybe don't want to play or you're always taking away the slot from someone that does want to play that slot or Another good example would be Vermintide releases a new class. Good luck getting a queue as that subclass because everyone's queuing as it. Or you and your friends want to play? Well, you all have to take turns now playing that subclass. So I do like that that, uh, that restriction has been lifted, although I think that that does add a lot of um, thematic gameplay into the mix. So I think that's a personal um, a thing you have to make the decision on whether or not you like. I love it because I think it opens up and broadens the uh, party variability, and I think it makes it very different for, for tackling different missions, maps, and difficulties with that party variety. So that's my kind of general gameplay breakdown here. I, it's kind of long-winded here, about eight minutes, but I'm really impressed with the graphics. I'm really impressed with the atmosphere. That's probably the big thing for me, even though Vermintide was extremely atmospheric and had amazing display uh, uh, visuals. I just think that maybe I skew heavily towards 40K over fantasy when it comes to wanting a good 40K game. We just don't really get enough good 40K games, and Dark Tide finally feels like a good 40K game, even if it is simply a Vermintide clone, which is a Left 4 Dead clone. You know, like 
if you're looking at it from those constituent parts, it can be very um, monotonous to kind of break it down like that. But I'm still saying that the game stands on its own very strong. If you've never played Vermintide, you are going to love Darktide. My friend that I streamed with, he had never played any of the games. He's like, man, this is so fun. If you have played thousands of hours of Vermintide, I still think Darktide delivers a real cool change up to the formula in an interesting way because you're playing through a different kind of format of heavy focus on range here. But if you're already bored with Vermintide altogether, you're not going to get anything different here with Darktide. So that's my kind of initial breakdown of the gameplay. Not a full-fledged review, of course, where I'm going to wait for that full uh, launch to give you guys that. But let me go into my a quick little breakdown of each character. Again, it was such a limited playthrough. I can't give you like a, well, this character is going to be shit type statement because we don't know. We don't know if some talents are going to be leaving and changing and whatnot. And we'll talk about that balance of power as we jump into each respective class. And I'm going to start this discussion with the Psyker. And I think this is one of the ones that people are very interested in because I think it, it thematically seems very cool, very fun. And I think, by and large, it's my least favorite of the four classes. And it's not because I don't think it's a cool class. I think it's really cool. You have a four sword. You can imbue that four sword. Your, um, your grenade is not a grenade. You could just blow up something's head and pop it. And I think that's the issue, though. You, you do get a force staff, and that, that staff will allow you to pretty much just wade through large uh, amounts of units and hordes, which is fun. You have to unlock it, though. That, that's neither here nor there, but it's, it's, it's something that if you, just, if you just boot the class up and only play one or two games of it, you go, ah, this class is bare bones. It's because you need to unlock the force staff to really get advantage of the fun stuff. But the, the head unlock, or I'm sorry, head unlock, the head popping thing, it's cool. It's fun. It's absolutely necessary, though, in top level difficulties. Like if you're playing against specials, you need to have the capability to blow them up from range. But what I don't like about it, and you'll see it on the screen in this in this gameplay, um, is you, you'll see me charging it up. This little white gauge fills up. It reaches the top. It makes a, a, a an auditorial cue, and then you can blow someone's head up. Um, and even Ogren's, I think it's like two charges, and it'll still blow their head up. My problem is if you get interrupted if you have to stop for whatever reason you just completely waste the charge and doing this highlights it for all the other members of the party who will then focus and kill that thing down or burst that thing down i just i think it just the happenstance of playing like that people say oh oh this has got a halo i should probably shoot and kill this thing and because of that you lose the capability to actually do the damage but you've gained all of the peril this pretty much gives you about three casts of this before you trigger 100% peril. If you trigger 100% peril and you do anything that would then increase your peril, you either imbuing your force sword, using your force staff, uh, uh, using your G ability again, you will explode. You can wait for it to naturally go down, you can cleanse it holding R or use your ultimate to cleanse it. So there's ways to cleanse it immediately when that's fine and all. But it can kind of feel lackluster if you're trying to play through, have a good time, you're trying to blow something's head up and someone keeps killing it. Oh, there's there's a special. On the lower difficulties, I think that the Psyker suffers because you never get a chance to really feel important because people can kill things so much faster than you can actually charge up your warp charge. So, and that's another thing. The multiple times that you, each time you get one off, you gain a warp charge, which increases your damage. So you, you need to build these up so you do more damage. It, it makes you, it's kind of a centerpiece of the, of the, of the, of the class. But again, in higher difficulties, it's way different. Lower difficulties, way different. What I think would make it more interesting is, and just this simple thing could change it, is rather than uh, waiting to 100% of that white gauge to fill up to then release it to pop ahead, if you release it, let's say like 25, 35, 50, 60, whatever percentage of that gauge, it still does damage. It might not blow their head up, but it still does damage, staggers them a little bit. So if you're in a pinch, someone's, someone's charging into you, you can at least unleash a little bit of damage and you don't feel like you just gained a bunch of peril and now you have to purge that peril or someone killed something and the same thing happens. That's my big issue with the Psyker because it feels like it needs its talents to be fun in any way. And the beginning portion of the game, I think, is going to create a natural barrier of entry to people that need that long-term investment to really feel the class pop off. So now having talked about my least favorite, let me talk about my most favorite class. And by the way, when I'm saying most and least, I'm not saying that these classes are unplayable or unfixable you know anything that i've talked about is an easily easily done away with with a patch right oh hey you know what that's going to be fixed or 
some of the stuff might completely change by launch. Like my my favorite being the preacher, they might have they might completely change a mechanic that they've already changed in a current development build that we just don't know about. But the preacher is just so damn fun. You get up close and personal. You're slicing and dicing with an axe, with a sword. You get a shotgun. You get a, a an SMG, which is the auto pistol. You'll get a flamer when that gets unlocked. Then you have the thunder hammer. When the thunder hammer hits something, it flenses off all the flesh on their face. Like I was saying before, it's so cool. Like watching Indie Pride go through with his thunder hammer he has a whole video of it on his channel so please go check it out i don't have it i didn't have it unlocked i watched him play with it was badass it's so cool it's so fun and the ultimate is really cool because it allows you to use it and completely regain your toughness which is your shield it just was a it was a fast-paced hard-hitting class that i really liked that i didn't feel like i was going to be a a glass cannon i thought that the preacher or the zealot for that matter was going to be just okay yeah this character's just going to get slapped around if they get reduced all the way to no health they get invulnerability for a limited amount of time they have so many ways to keep their toughness up through melee combat through their ultimate through other talents that it felt useful from turn one well, turn one what the hell wrong game from level one all the way up to the max level i got which was like level 10 so i really like preacher or zealot preacher um and i'm really curious to see what zealot can become from other subclasses that really excites me because the preacher is so fun what other kind of stuff are we going to get like uh, it would be cool if it was like an arco flagellant or something like that where it's just pure melee or something of the sort i do think that we need to see something that don't need to see but i think it would be cool to see more class subclasses that are like the bretonian that doesn't have any ranged because it's solely going to be focused on uh, melee or doesn't have any melee because it's solely focused on range through whatever it is like the fists for the uh like the they're basically like lightning claws for like the uh ogres and stuff like that i would love to see some kind of units in um in the subclasses ahead that are like that but that's my kind of breakdown of the preacher very hard hitting very fast paced very enjoyable uh character I, I know that they say like yo play the guardsman if you want like a typical rts experience but if you want like a typical run and gun and call of duty experience i feel like the preacher is a little bit more your your bet because yeah you run around with an smg and just gun things down and then pop into your sword and just rip them up oh you're running low on health press f and oh, okay your shield's back you know like i feel like there's so many ways that make preacher very fun and very very action-packed but also somewhat safe next up is the veteran sharpshooter now i really like the option to play a veteran and i really think we could have a lot of fun with a bunch of different subclass variants the sharpshooter is really strong and really good it gets a talent that allows a five percent chance to auto regenerate a grenade so it's people pretty much spamming grenades i wouldn't be surprised if that talent completely leaves the guardsman or is nerfed or put on some sort of recast like um hey yeah it's five percent and then it's on a two minute um a cooldown and it won't it only goes off every two minutes um, so you can't just spam grenades, but it is really nice because the whole party can replenish their grenades and the ultimate for the veteran is absolutely crucial in the higher difficulties because you pop it and it immediately gives sight on all the specials so you guys can focus them down quickly, hard and fast. It's a really, really, really fun class. Also, it gets access to shotgun and it's 75% increase to ammunition means you're just constantly shooting with the character which is I think really cool it's a great way to make this a, a ranged character without making him be a different ranged character right like you look at Corellian her range capabilities are different than the other ranged characters by and large like her ultimate um, her access to weaponry and so on and so forth the shotgun is on both the zealot and on the sharpshooter but the sharpshooter gets 75% more ammo, so you can take advantage of that shotgun a little bit better, a little bit differently. So I like that kind of way of making the range combat for the character feel more important by the grace of talents that increase ammunition or maybe just unlocks whatever it is. But the sharpshooter, I think, is very fun, really enjoyable. I personally enjoyed the melee combat much more on the Ogryn or the Preacher or Zealot. So I did not play the sharpshooter as much, but I think I'm really excited for the options of subclasses for the veteran. And I think the veteran is going to be what most people jive with because they can, they can just kill things and pop heads so fast in the game and just have an endless supply of grenades currently that makes them very fun and very interesting. And who doesn't want to be a veteran guardsman, man? Like that's really sick. So I think it'll be one of those classes that will always stand out and always kind of skew more popular than the other ones. But I had a lot of fun with it. But let's talk about the big boy. So when I booted up Dark Tide, I didn't think I'd like the Preacher. 
I didn't think I'd like the Skullbreaker, you know, the Ogryn or Ogryn. I, I haven't listened to an audiobook in recent times enough to know if it's an Ogryn or an Ogryn. But I thought I'd love the veteran sharpshooter. The Skullbreaker is so damn fun. It is so fun to play in a party with four big meaty boys slapping things around with your knife or punching things. Like, it's so fun. And then your bull rush just knocks things over. You have a converted grenade launcher that just shoots crap. Like, it is very enjoyable. And I, it has so much health attached to it. It's a necessary thing in your uh, party composition because it just needs that... Uh, um, you need that heavy hitting, or I'm sorry, heavy hit point meat shield. Um, it just is so good. It's so good. You can just sit there and wade through so much damage and absorb so much damage. And then your aura helps dish out more damage and then getting access to the grinder and eventually like the grenade gauntlets. There are so many cool things attached to the skull breaker that I think it's probably the one that people will that probably slept on the most coming into the game, that once they tried the closed beta, were surprised with how much they enjoyed the character. From the voice lines, the character um, personalities, the weapon choices, the play style, I really, really, really love the Skullbreaker. I think it's so fun, and I'm really excited to then eventually get access to the shield and try that out. Maybe the heavy stub gun, try that out if it gets access to it. Maybe that's a different subclass, whatever it is. But it is so enjoyable to play this class and i i think i will probably main the zealot and the skullbreaker because they're just they're just that much they're just that fun to be in close combat and really enjoy the the flow of combat and using like your dagger or your it's not a dagger your sword or your um your mace to kind of clobber things apart now i will say though it's a struggle to play as a veteran with more than one Skullbreaker on the team because they just they fill up a narrow causeway or a narrow hallway to the point where you just have no choice but to accidentally get a bunch of friendly fire hits on, on them because of the nature of dodging left and right and backwards and blocking and pushing in Dark Tide. So there is that. It's going to require the presence of multiple Skullbreakers kind of requires more awareness for your your uh, other players. And I think it's going to be kind of a hassle when it comes to playing with uh, pugs that just maybe don't really know, hey, you know, I'm getting way too much team damage on my my characters and you're causing your, your frontline uh, Ogrens to just get completely kicked in the ass. So there is that to kind of contend with. But I, I really like the class. Like the grenade, you don't have a grenade that you throw. You throw a box of grenades. Um, but then you get a talent that allows those boxes to that box to detonate the, the grenades inside. Just so fun. So cool. Really, really enjoy it. Didn't think I would. And I'm a huge fan. All right. We've talked about a lot. We've talked about a general game breakdown. We've gone over my impressions of the gameplay. We've gone to individual classes. But the real question is, is Dark Tide going to be worth it when it launches? Is it something that you're going to want to wait for more content to hit it or whatever it is? And... I think you can kind of tell where I'm going with this. I'm going to say yes, but it's important to note the fact that Dark Tide is a $40 game. It's not a $60 game. So that already kind of kind of relieves the burden of the game having a need for a whole ton of stuff. You can get you can get away with a little bit more. You can get away with a little bit more at 40 bucks. I am worried about what kind of microtransactions, quote unquote, we might be encountering, right? We already kind of get them a little bit with cosmetics and Vermintide. The fact that we're only getting one subclass of every single main class does worry me that it's just going to be pennied out to, okay, you want another subclass? Here's another $5 subclass. Here's another $5 subclass. Because they've done that a lot with adding one new subclass to every single Vermintide class. And it's been a whole big product launch and everything like that. I don't want to buy three subclasses piecemeal across the longevity of the game if they say hey yeah you know we just we're going to divide them up in, in, in major content um releases in the same way they did for the e, winds of magic or the chaos magic one whatever one's the free uh content pack they delivered for vermintide i'm okay with that and maybe some of them are a little bit more premium cool with that but i am just a little wary of it because 
at $40, it's cool, but is it $40 because they've got $20 of DLC planned in the first couple months? That's going to be kind of rough and tumble for me. I think gameplay-wise, the game personally holds up. Some people are pretty disappointed, um, but I think that from the reception I've seen during the streams and stuff like that, most people are really excited for the game. I think that it's finally a time that we get a really strong um, team co-op shooter for Warhammer 40k right we haven't had a good one in a long time and I think this is a real great way to jump in there was the one that came out uh what Necromunda gun for hire which is a, a great quick little like doom clone right but this would be fun to experience that vermin tide formula in that 40k universe and I'm exper I'm really curious to see what that top level of play looks like what those other unlocks are going to look like for dark tide and I definitely think that it's going to be a game that is that is going to do really well. I think it's been a game that's going to be around for a long time because it has that 40k brand on it and you can just do so much. There's so many ways you can go with new races, new classes, new everything to be added to the game, new new opponents. There's just so many different ways and things you can do, especially in an underhive. You can jump off to a whole new world if you want or whatever it is where the kind of limitations of Vermintide exist of it being, you know, geographically wherever it is or whatever kind of bullshit statement I'm trying to say. I guess that there was something with like the limitation on the engine for Vermintide and why they couldn't do certain things, but I, I don't know. That's hearsay. I have no idea what I'm really talking about with that. So I think Dark Tide is definitely going to be worth it come November 30th. I'm excited to cover it more as we, it sounds like we'll be getting one more beta, probably an open beta um, to just dive in one more time before we jump into the game come November 30th. And again, I'm really curious to see what those future subclasses and weapon unlocks look like. Go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Are you excited for Dark Tide? Do you think it's going to be a great game? Are you timid are there certain things that you really want to see improve before you jump into it um, i did not talk about game performance at all in this because it was a closed beta the game ran very well for me i could definitely find places that were unoptimized and didn't do well but it's hard for me to make a, a judgment claim on those things because they outright said like hey yeah there's some graphical settings that we just haven't even optimized at all like ray tracing would be one of them you touch ray tracing your frames drop so it's hard to give you an actual indication of what the performance is like. Some people had terrible performance, but most of the people I talked to seem to have either passable or good performance. So take that with a grain of salt. It's going to be, I think it's a year mileage, may, may vary type of thing, depending on what your machine's like and what you did with the closed beta. But there you go, guys. There's my impressions of Warhammer 40,000 Dark Tide. Very excited for it to be coming out here in almost a month and a half. Go ahead and let me know what you're feeling in the comment section below. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.